Hey everybody, happy Wednesday. We are glad that you are joining us online. Uh, clearly there's somebody new sitting here with me. This is Dana. You probably have seen her if you come to the church. Um, you've seen her singing with me up on stage as well. Um, Dana is kind of part of our family here, uh, so she helps hang out with some of the our little dudes uh, during the week uh, while Brianne's working from home. So um, she's part of our circle, so don't worry. The social distancing doesn't really count here. She's part of our family. Um, it still counts, but what are you going to do? Uh, hey, for Wednesday service, we wanted the opportunity, since this is our last Lent service, um, it's not the end of Lent, but it's the last Lent service, uh, we wanted to make sure that we got some Holden music in there. So forgive us for the fact that we're not going to be making virtual eye contact with you. We're going to be pretty buried in some music. Uh, but we want to make it happen and get through this this music with you, and um, we don't want you to miss out on the opportunity to sing this with us. So uh, let's sing some holding together. Here we go. Jesus Christ, you are the light of the world. The light no darkness can overcome. Stay with us now, for it is evening. Let your light scatter the darkness And shine within your people Joyous light of heavenly glory Loving glow of God's own face In the same creation story shine on every land and race now as evening falls around us we shall raise our songs to you God of daybreak God of shadows come and light our hearts anew in the stars that sing our thanks to God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. Blessed are you, creator of the universe. From old you have led your people by night and day. May the light of your Christ make our darkness bright. For your word and your presence are the light of our pathways, and you are the light and life of all creation. Amen. prayer rise up like incense before you the lifting up of my hands 
as an offering to you. Oh God, I call to you. Come to me now. Oh, hear my voice when I cry to you. Let my prayer rise up. Let's pray together. May our prayers come before you, O God, as incense. And may your presence surround and fill us, so that in union with all creation, we might sing your praise and your love in our lives. Amen. Good evening, Faith family. Thank you for joining us tonight for our Wednesday Lenten service. This will be our last Wednesday night service for this season as we head into Holy Week next week. It's hard to believe that we're already there. And I imagine that my life, much like your life, has changed a lot over just even the last couple of weeks. Steve and I are both mostly working from home. The girls are both uh, online, doing online school at home. Uh, Abby's in, should have been in the middle of dance competition season and that isn't happening. Jesse had started tennis and that isn't happening and Joshua has been furloughed from his job as well. And so our lives have changed in many, many ways and in a lot of ways that we didn't even expect. And I'm sure that you are finding that to be true as well. In this wilderness time, there is so much changing. It makes me think of the verse in Isaiah 40 verse 8 where it says the grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of God stands forever. So tonight as we come together to spend some time in his word, we remember that even though times are changing and life for us is changing, the world is changing, that God is unchanging and that his word also is unchanging. So let's turn together tonight to 2 Corinthians 5. This passage helps us remember who we are and whose we are. Would encourage you, if you haven't already read the devotional for today that Ralph Josephson did, to do that. And that's where this text comes from. So 2 Corinthians 5 reminds us of who we are. So let's begin at verse 17. It says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. We learn there more about who we are, that we are a new creation, that every day when we get up and we remember our baptism, we remember that God has given us a new beginning and that we are a new creation, that he has transformed us. I have mentioned before that my first few years out of seminary, I spent at an inner city congregation in Denver and we'd been there, Steve and I, about a year when we decided that it might be good to move into the neighborhood. And so we started looking for places to live and we found a house that we decided we would like to buy. We did a full redo of this house. And so we started by changing out the roof and putting a new roof on, on it. We put in a new furnace. Uh, we redid the flooring throughout the house fully gutted the kitchen that actually was while I was pregnant with the belly out to here with Joshua and so those were interesting times living without a kitchen and a little one on the way Steve took out a wall in that process and then we also uh, gutted the bathroom all the way down to the studs and in those walls we found razors we found other paraphernalia in those walls as well 
When we moved in, there were big bars that went across all of the uh, external doors that served as barricade, barricade bars. There were big locks on all of the closets in each of the bedrooms. There was a tree in the backyard that had had a watchdog chained to it. And he had pulled and pulled and pulled, and that chain had become part of the tree. And so we worked hard, too, to get that chain worked back out from the tree. We did a lot to that house, and it was beautiful. It was like a new creation. Even more than that, though, we gave that house to God. When we bought that house, we prayed, and we prayed through every nook and cranny in that house and said, God, we want this house to be your house, and we want this to be a place where you are seen and where you are known. And so it was a place where uh, God made a transformation, where God's light was seen in that neighborhood. And as we uh, invited him in, as, as we prayed, and as we opened our doors to our neighbors, people began to comment on the light that this house was on that block, that they could see that something was different, that something had changed. And it wasn't us. It was God. And the way that he took that house, and it looked different, but it also was different. What once was full of drugs and many other dark things that happened there was now full of God, full of his love, full of his grace, full of his mercy, full of his presence. God does this with us too. He transforms us. He changes us. He makes us into a new creation. He takes down walls. He puts in new gear where we need it. He takes us and he makes us beautiful. He fills us with himself. The old has gone and the new has come. We are a new creation, and God continues his work in us. In a time like this pandemic, he continues his work in us. This transformation happens as we are reconciled to him. His presence in our life makes all of the difference. We are changed all the way through because of his presence, because of his grace, because of his love, because of his mercy. And so as we go through 2 Corinthians 5 here, we remember who we are in him. As we continue, we see then to whose we are, who it is that we belongs to. So let's look at verses 18 and 19. It says, all this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. And he was committed to us the message of reconciliation that we belong to God, that we are his, that God is love, that he is the one that reconciles us to himself, God who is love, who would go to these great lengths to bring us back to him. That is the God that we love and serve, and that is whose we are. So we continue to verse 20 here then. We're reminded again of who we are, so let's look at verse 20. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. And so we learn here that we are called to be God's ambassadors, that we are called to, to invite others to reconcile with God as well, that God has invited us into his mission to be a part of his work, that we can introduce people to him, that we are invited by God to share his love with others as well. We remember who we are, and that is people who have been invited into God's mission. Verse 21 here is very powerful as it talks about whose we are. This verse might sound familiar and you might even find yourself singing it as it is a popular song, but let's read it. Verse 21, 
God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And we remember here that it is God's work that makes this all happen, that God sacrificed his son. He is the one doing the action here, that he sent his son to the cross for us, that he who had no sin took on our sin, and God then brings us back to himself. And so we are reconciled to him through Jesus. God loves us in a big, powerful, strong way. And he shows us that love through the sacrifice that he makes. So 2 Corinthians 5 reminds us of who we are as well as whose we are. Now tomorrow, uh, Nanette has the devotional for tomorrow. Would encourage you to check that out tomorrow as well. Let's turn to the verses that that's based on, though, in Isaiah 43. These are uh, some of my favorite verses. I love the flow of this. So Isaiah 43, verses 18 and 19 say, Forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the desert and streams in the wasteland. Isn't that a great visual? Streams in the wasteland. Eugene Peterson says that the gospel message basically says that we don't live in a world ruled by chance. We live in a world ruled by the God of Exodus and Easter that he will do things in you that neither you nor your friends would have supposed possible. God is at work, and his work in you is not done yet. We remember through these verses that we are his, that we are reconciled to him, that we are a new creation, that we are ambassadors for God. And that God is loving, he is creative, he is at work, he is powerful, and now he is doing new things. So as we remember who we are and whose we are, we then are compelled to love. So let's turn back to 2 Corinthians 5, where Paul talks about this. In response to God's love for us, we then love others. Listen to how Paul says this in verses 14 to 15. For Christ's love compels us. It's a good place to underline right there. For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves but for him who died for them and was raised again. Paul says God has called us to this reconciliation ministry that he loved us, continues to love us, and share generously his love with us. And that then compels us to love others, to live not for ourselves like it talks about in verse 15, but instead to live for him. We do that by sharing his love with others. So we remember who we are and whose we are. We are compelled to love. Verse 16 continues. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Paul talks about how now that he belongs to God, now that he has been reconciled to God, now that he is a new creation, that he's not free to look at people from just an earthly human perspective. If God's love was made available for all of us, if Jesus died for all of us, then we are called to look at others the way that God looks at them too. When Jesus came to Paul, Paul's life was changed forever. Paul was changed forever. Paul was a new creation, and his attitude was also a new attitude. How often do we think, I don't really like him, or I don't agree with her, or who do they think they are anyway? Sometimes our judgment is even with groups of people. 
thinking about uh, people who are homeless or people of other religions or people who are poor or people who don't look like us. And we distance ourselves from them instead of moving towards them and showing God's love to them. So we are compelled by love. Paul began to look at people through the potential of the cross and the transformation that comes through God's love. As we remember who we are and whose we are, we are compelled to love, to love as God loves to know that if God made us a new creation, that he can make our neighbors a new creation, that he can make the person that hurt us a new creation, that he can make the person that drives you crazy a new creation. He can make people that you feel uncomfortable with a new creation. And so we take the cross to them, the gospel of good news to them. We take God's love to them. Verse 18 talks about how God has given to us this ministry of reconciliation. And so we are compelled to show others God's love. As we remember who we are and whose we are, we are compelled to love other people. Again, this quote from Eugene Peterson, you don't live in a random world ruled by chance. You live in a world ruled by the God of Exodus and Easter. Think of how powerful and loving God is, the God of Exodus and Easter. And then he says, he will do things in you that neither you nor your friends would have supposed possible. Love compels us, and God then does some great things through us. Sometimes it starts with something just really little. We are in difficult, crazy times calls for us to get creative and for us to get out of our comfort zones. God is giving us right now new opportunities in these unprecedented times. One of my favorite stories about uh, how God works and how he works through us was during unprecedented times as well. And it happened in LA with a priest named Greg Boyle. He's written a couple different books, but one of those is Tattoos on the Heart, where he talks about this uh, church that he was a part of named Dolores Mission Catholic Church uh, in East L.A. And it was in the early 1990s that gang violence erupted there. There were eight gangs that were in conflict in the neighborhoods around this little parish. Killings and injuries happened every day. So in this parish, there was a group of women who met to pray and to study. And one day when they got together to study, they studied the story of Jesus walking on the water. And something clicked for one of those women as she saw the parallels between that story and her own life. So that night, she gathered 70 women, and they began a a procession from one barrio to the next one. They brought food, they brought guitars, they brought love. As they ate and drank uh, with these gang members, chips and salsa and some Coca-Colas, they sang a few songs together, even with some of them. The gangs were completely disoriented and they were baffled at what was happening. That night, the war zones were silent. So each night, this group of women would walk. They would intrude and intervene nonviolently. They broke the rules of war. That old script of retaliation and this escalating violence was challenged and it was changed. These women called these nighttime journeys love walks. They were women who were compelled by the love of God. They looked at these gang members and they saw them through God's eyes. As the relationships between these women and the gang members grew, the gang members started telling their stories and they talked about uh, the lack of jobs that there were. They talked about their anger over police brutality. They talked about the rage of hopelessness and poverty. So out of that then, this parish began a school. Then a little bit longer, they launched their first social enterprise business called Homeboy Bakery where some of these gang members could come then and learn some job skills. So there would be uh, members of different gangs working side by side uh, each other at this homeboy bakery. 
This grew into Homeboy Industries. It is the largest and most successful gang rehab and re-entry program in the world. Homeboy offers an exit ramp, if you will, for those that are stuck in the cy cycle of violence and incarceration. It has a holistic approach where these men and women can come and they can overcome their past and they can start to reimagine their futures and they can break these intergenerational cycles of gang violence. Father Boyle said that he hopes to allay the violence and to guide gang members to Jesus and to sound moral footing by bombarding them with unconditional love. This is a congregation that was compelled to love. They knew who they were and whose they were, and it moved them to reach out in unconditional love. There is no wilderness space that is too harsh or too threatening for God's love. In the midst of this pandemic, God's love lives on. Romans 8 talks about how God works for the good in all things for those that love him. How have you seen God at work in these times that we're in? How do you see other people sharing his love? How are you sharing his love? You may have heard, hopefully, uh, now through social media and, and other communication from the church, that the church has started a grocery program where we can shop and deliver groceries to those that need them. We have had a great and generous response to the pandemic relief fund as well, which will go out to those people who have lost their jobs and who are struggling because of what is happening heard about God at work in many ways right now. There's some great stories circulating. A friend of ours is a pulmonologist at National Jewish, and you may have heard that a couple of his colleagues are headed to New York. So they're going into the war zone, if you will, because they are compelled to love the people. Great stories about teachers right now who are so creative and working so hard to bring uh, classrooms online. And in that, just so creative in how they're reaching their students. Parades that the teachers have done and driving by some of the kids' houses. Or Andrew's mother-in-law was on the news, a kindergarten teacher, and she delivered some care packages to her kids and would wave at them through the windows. Maybe you've heard about Italy, where people have come out onto their balconies and shared this amazing music together. You may have, as you've wandered through your neighborhoods, noticed some stuffed bears in the windows as people put those bears in the windows so that kids can go on a bear hunt. Sidewalk chalk is appearing in all sorts of different places with some uh, great words of encouragement, but also some beautiful art. Sometimes it's just something really simple like a phone call. In a minute, I want you to pause this and spend some time. If you are social, socially isolating on your own, I would encourage you to spend a few minutes in prayer thanking God for the ways that you see him at work. Or you, if you are socially distancing yourself with your family, spend some time in conversation about these questions. How have you seen God at work? during these times? How do you see other people sharing his love? And how are you sharing his love? And then as you talk about that too, if you wanna comment on this video, I think it's important for us to share with each other how we see God at work. Where is it that we see God at work and how is he working through you as well? Because those stories help encourage us and help us remember who we are and whose we are and that God calls us into this ministry of reconciliation and love. So go ahead and pause, take a few minutes and talk about how have you seen God at work in these times? How do you see other people sharing his love? And how are you sharing his love as well? So as we come back together then, uh, we see outside today, maybe not tomorrow, we'll see how the weather goes. There's some flowers starting to pop up and I'm wearing flowers on my shirt tonight because I am ready for spring. And spring every year is a reminder and an indication of new beginnings. And next week we head into Holy Week and to Easter, what a new beginning that is. And so we remember who we are and whose we are, 
And because of that, we are compelled to love. That God is with us through this wilderness. And he continues to show his love. And he is offering us new opportunities to do the same. Let's pray. God, thank you for who you are. We praise you tonight as the God of the Exodus and Easter. A God who is powerful, loving, merciful, grace-giving, and who generously shares your love with us. So we pray during this time that you would hide in our hearts these words uh, from scripture that we've heard tonight, that we are a new creation, that you, God, continue to work in our midst, that you continue to show your love. Help us to share those stories with each other. And we offer ourselves to you, too, and pray that you would work through us, that you would help us as we're compelled to love, to find creative ways uh, to offer your love to other people. Thank you for your presence during this time, that in a, a time that's crazy, a little chaotic, where it feels like every day things are changing, we know that you are not, that you are unchanging, and that your word stands forever. Continue to give us your peace. Continue to guide and direct us. Holy Spirit, prompt us in the ways that we can share your love. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Oh,
Merciful God, source and ground of all goodness and life, give to your people the peace that passes all understanding and the will to live your gospel of mercy and justice. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us bless our God. Praise and thanks to you. May God, creator, bless us and keep us. rest of your week. We'll see you on Sunday.